I don't want no oil. A spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things. A creeping and crawling won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No news. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Cle Columbus, and hello to everyone listening on the internet, wherever or where, whenever you are. This is Joe Demar, and you've tuned into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a program where we talk about ecology and the environment, and we talk about it in terms of how it affects you, your health, your happiness, your family, your pocketbook. And we also look at the environment from a positive standpoint. There's a lot of doom and gloom right now about the environment. People are talking about global warming and how we're all doomed if we don't change things. And that might be true, but change doesn't have to be this angst-ridden, uh, terrible thing that causes us all suffering. One of our main points on For a Green Future is that this can be a very gentle transition, and it can be a transition that will actually improve your health. It'll make you healthier, wealthier, and happier, because really this addiction to carbon that our society is based on is hurting you in ways you don't even realize. I mean, you might feel it when you go to the gas pump and, and try to fill your tank. That's one, one way that you can feel it. But every day, this, this addiction to fossil fuels is hurting you and your family. For example, um, there's thousands of people who die every year from lung diseases simply because there's car exhaust, there's exhaust from burning coal, there's air pollution, and that's killing thousands of people every year. Once we switch to wind and solar, those people will not get sick. They'll, they will live longer, healthier lives. And right now there's children being uh, feeling asthma, especially in the big cities where there's lots of traffic. If you've had a child with asthma, and I have, you know, it's heartbreaking to watch them struggling to breathe. And so every time we switch away from carbon, every time you don't start the car, every time we shut down a coal plant, Fewer and fewer children have to suffer that the effects of the air pollution have to suffer those terrible asthma attacks. So for a green future, we, we like to focus on the positive. And uh, this is a very special episode of For a Green Future because this is what we call a, a one that's, we're taking this episode out of the can, so to speak. This is a pre-recorded episode. It's going to be played in, in case of anything dramatic that prevents me from getting into the station and so unfortunately you won't be able to call in during this hour but we're very happy that you're listening and, and we hope we can keep your attention for this whole hour because um it's vital that we all get on board with this and with these environmental issues i started for a green future part of the reason i started for a green future is that Radio is a unique medium, and podcasts are kind of like radio, but there's something extra special about radio, and that is that it reaches everyone. It goes across all groups, all boundaries. Conservatives listen to radio, liberals listen to radio, right-wing, left-wing, rich people listen to radio, poor people listen to radio. 
everyone listens to radio, and there's very few things in our society today now that do that. I mean, once upon a time, when I was a kid, there were three major television stations, and that was it. And pretty much most people would watch particular shows on those three stations. So you'd be to school the next day, and everybody would have watched, oh, I don't know, pick an old show, that, that episode of Happy Days. We'd all have this common experience. And that is being driven out of our society right now because with the data managing techniques, with data mining techniques, people who want to sell you things and people who want to convince you of things are able to put people into narrower and narrower focuses and smaller and smaller groups divide us up, separate us from each other based on our beliefs and prefer preferences. And that is not healthy. That is not democracy. And I am a great believer of democracy. I, I really believe that if a question is put to the people, to put to all of us, and all of us look at it squarely and try to come up with the best answer possible, most of the time, the majority of the people are going to make better decisions than any one of us or any group of us, any small group of us. Because our shared experience, our shared wisdom is much greater than the wisdom of any small group of us. And that's partly why I wanted to do a show that reaches out to everyone on radio specifically and talk radio because there's no learning without feedback. So when people do call into the show, I'm really grateful and uh, I enjoy that feedback immensely. This show, that won't be happening, so it's, it's, you're going to hear some, some stories that I think you might find interesting. I don't know when this show is going to air, so I can't talk about specific things that are going on, but I can give you some history, some things I've seen and learned over my uh, 57 years at this point. I just had a birthday. And I'm, I'm hoping you can benefit from them. So one of the things that, if you're a regular listener to the show, you know that I, I'm always in direct opposition to nuclear power. And as I was driving in today, I saw that um, the plume from the davis Bessey nuclear plant was there putting huge clouds of water vapor up into the air the way it does every day when davis Bessey is running. Of course, Davis Bessie has had a lot of outages, a lot of unplanned shutdowns. There was actually a period of about two years where Davis Bessie didn't run at all because they had a, they'd eat, they had dissolved a hole into the head of the reactor from boric acid, and so the reactor head had to be replaced. And those two years were great. I would look over to the east. I would look over where the plume used to be, and there was nothing, and I would feel this immense sense of relief because I know that every minute of every day that nuclear power plants run, they're producing tons of radioactive pollution. They're producing over 200 different radioactive isotopes. And these isotopes, they can be radioactive forms of pretty much everything, carbon, um, hydrogen, calcium, strontium, all sorts of atoms can be are made radioactive in the heart of a of a nuclear reactor. And you're like, well, what's the big deal? Why, who cares if, a, if an atom is made radioactive? Well, radioactive atoms act just like suicide bombers. Um, radioactive atoms chemically are exactly the same as non-radioactive atoms, and so your body will treat them like a regular atom. So if you have some carbon, radioactive carbon, for example, it would get put into your body uh, radioactive cesium is a good example because that is, an, is a radioactive element that gets incorporated up into your muscle cells, and specifically it affects your heart. And so if you've absorbed a radioactive atom of cesium, that atom will go into your heart. It'll sit there inside your muscle cells just going along, but at some random point, at some unpredictable point, it explodes just like a suicide bomber. And that explosion shoots off uh, charged particles in all directions. And those particles can hit the surrounding cells and it can kill them or it can damage them. And it can damage their DNA and that's how it causes cancer. Well, so every minute of every day, 
all these nuclear plants are churning away, creating these radioactive atoms that make the Earth less habitable. Uh, radiation is inimical to life. Radiation is the opposite of life. Where there's high radiation, nothing can live. And it's kind of a tricky random thing because sometimes a little radiation causes a lot of damage. Sometimes a lot of radiation doesn't seem to cause much damage. Uh, in fact, back one of the things that we learned when we were um, back during the Cold War, yes, I am 57, was that the radiation from a, ra a nuclear blast goes out in all directions from the nuclear bomb. And there's zones that have differing levels of radiation. And in those zones, you have different percentages of people that die. And so very close to the, to the bomb, at the highest level radiation, 100% of the people die. Go out farther, 75, go out farther, 50%. And there's no way to predict who's going to be in that 50%. It's completely random. And the nuclear power industry uses this randomness to try to shift responsibility, to duck responsibility for the fact that they are making the Earth less habitable. There's been studies that show that leukemia and thyroid cancer rates double within five miles of a nuclear power plant. And in fact, it was those studies that led Germany to decide to ban nuclear power altogether. But the problem is that even though you've got a group of people and you expose them to radiation and you double the, amount of, the number of cancers, you can't say which of those cancers were doubled because of the radiation and which would have happened naturally. There are natural causes of radiation, and there's natural radiation in the environment. Uh, I have a Geiger counter sitting at home that uh, I leave going most of the time, and uh, it's usually sitting somewhere around 18 counts per minute, and which means that just in the background, either radon gas from under the ground or uh, charged particles coming in from outer space, there's about 18 counts per minute is the normal radiation level down in Bowling Green. So you've got people dying, and you can't tell which ones were, were being killed or being sickened by the nuclear radiation. And the, the nuclear industry takes advantage of this confusion or this inability to specify, to say, you know, you can't say that we caused that cancer. You can't say we caused that leukemia. Well, that's true. But you can say with mathematical certainty that they did cause half of them. You just can't say which ones. So I've been burdened with this knowledge for all my adult life. And the reason that happened was back in when I was young, when I was still in high school, I started learning about ecology. And the wonderful thing about ecology, you know, I've heard nuclear physicists say that the equations that govern uh, nuclear fission are absolutely beautiful. Well, the fact that all of us are connected, interconnected in the environment, to me, is wonderfully beautiful and complex. This exchange of atoms that, that goes on, that carbon that you breathe, literally the, the carbon that you're putting into the air right now, there's so many carbon atoms, they get mixed around in the atmosphere, they travel around at like 400 miles an hour, you are literally breathing carbon atoms that were being breathed by someone in China just a few weeks ago and people in Africa and, and lions and sea lions and whales. I mean, you are, we're all in the same atmosphere and our breath gets mixed into the atmosphere and there's so many atoms in each breath and that they're distributed so quickly through the atmosphere that we are all literally breathing in and out the same atoms. We're sharing the same atoms together. And it doesn't just go with breathing. Everything that we eat comes from the environment. Everything that everything we excrete goes out into the environment. We're constantly sharing not just calcium, but you know, oxygen and and hydrogen and we're we're constant we're we're all a mix of all this these nutrients and all these atoms. And 
when I was growing up, the Three Mile Island accident happened. And to me, that was a, a turning point. That was a, a shift in my consciousness because during that accident, the government and the corporations that owned Three Mile Island lied to us constantly and without pause and without hesitation. They stood up there and they said things like, oh, there's no danger of, from the radiation being released. And they also said, oh, we're not releasing any relation in radiation into the environment, even as they knowingly were venting the, the radiation from the core out into the air. And they also said there's no meltdown, there's no danger of a meltdown. Nuclear power plants can't melt down. We have too many safeguards. Well, in fact, there was a partial meltdown at Three Mile Island. And so they were standing there telling us there's nothing wrong, no danger, don't worry about it. Even as they were exposing the people of Pennsylvania around Harrisburg to high levels of radiation. And right now, that, that area around Three Mile Island has the highest rates of leukemia and brain cancer that in the nation. But the forces that be, the government, you know, won't draw the connection between that huge exposure during the first Three Mile Island accident and the actual results because what they've done, what they did was they said there's no, there was no meltdown and so here's our estimate of how much radiation re we released. And that estimate was based on the fact that there was no meltdown, that there were, the coolant got a little low, you know, some radioactive hydrogen bubbled around and got released. But when they got into the core 20 years later with a camera, they discovered, oh, yes, some of the radiation, some of the nuclear rods did melt down. And what that meant is that there were tens of thousands of times more radioactive atoms released into the environment than they used in their original calculations. Their original calculations it said, oh, there shouldn't be any significant effect from this radiation. So their original calculations are wrong, but they never went back and corrected them. They still use those calculations done back during the first Three Mile Island accident to judge the severity of the Three Mile Island accident when we know for a fact that they were off by factors of tens of thousands. And that is true of Fukushima. That was true of Chernobyl. That's true of every major nuclear accident, is that the, the initial estimates are tens of thousands, or in the case of Fukushima, millions of times, millions of times too low. And so Three Mile Island happened as I, at a very, when I was very impressionable, it was when I was in high school and I watched it unfold and I watched people being lied to and I, I saw the seriousness of the, the situation and that's kind of when I hardened into an environmentalist because I had been researching ecology on my own. I had been studying uh, ecology textbooks. I was reading them. I was a Boy Scout. We went camping. I, I, I knew... I still know hundreds of uh, wild plants and their names, and I've seen animals in the wild and so forth. And so I had an understanding of the mixed nature of the environment in on this planet. I understood that every single radioactive atom that you put into this environment, that you start mixing in with the, the normal healthy environment, damages life. And in the case of a lot of these radioactive atoms, like plutonium, for example, plutonium is the deadliest substance ever created. Uh, five grams of plutonium has enough radioactivity to kill 20 million people. So if you had five grams of plutonium and you knew how to distribute it properly, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to do this, so... Um, you'll just have to trust me. But if you distribute it properly, you could wipe out every person living in New York City with just a nickels. Five grams is about a nickel in terms of mass. So a nickel's worth of plutonium, you could wipe out every single person in New York City. And New York City would then become uninhabitable for a quarter of a million years because the half-life of 
plutonium is about 20,000 years. And what half-life means is that if you've got a lump of plutonium sitting in front of you, pure plutonium, every atom is radioactive. Every 20,000 years or so, about half of those will have um, degraded, they'll, they'll have exploded and changed to some other atom. So the half-life is a measure of how long it takes half of a, a group of radioactive atoms to blow up and change into other atoms. Sometimes they blow up and change into radioactive atoms, other radioactive atoms. Sometimes they blow up and change into inert atoms, regular old atoms. But you have to wait 10 half-lives in order for a, a given amount of radioactive material to become safe. You never get to zero. I, or you never really get to zero because you never know which atom is going to blow up and which atoms are going to stay uh, looking normal for a while. But so if you've got a bunch of atoms, if you've got a, a, an amount of plutonium, you have to wait 20,000 years or 200,000 years for those atoms to become inert, for that, for that lump of plutonium to become safe because you've got to wait the 10 half-lives. And so the damage from Three Mile Island, the damage from Fukushima, the damage from Chernobyl is not over, even though those, those events are quote-unquote over, because those atoms that they released are still in the environment. They're still causing cancers and mutations and sicknesses. And that, to me, is immoral. To me, it's immoral to, to take the radio, to cause, to create these radioactive atoms. And like I said, there's over 200 of them. So what we're doing is we're, we're creating these horrible radioactive atoms, and we're doing it for just a moment of electricity. That's the thing. that All nuclear power plants can do is generate electricity. And so... Nothing that we're doing with that electricity, not playing Xbox, not watching Survivor, not, um, not even listening to me on the Internet, nothing that we're doing is important enough to burden humans with and to burden the environment with these poisonous radioactive atoms for the next quarter million years. I mean, could you think of anything that's important enough that you've, you've done today that you're willing to essentially cause sickness and death in our future generations for another quarter million years. I don't think so. I mean, you know, maybe you've got to go get lunch or something, or maybe you're, you you want to stay up late and so you want to leave the light on in the living room. That's not important enough to burden our descendants with nuclear waste for a quarter million years. But that's what's happening, and that's what happens every day, every minute of every day that a nuclear plant runs. So... To me, nuclear power is kind of a hot-button issue. Nuclear power kind of separates the quote-unquote real environmentalists and ecologists from the posers. Um, I recently testified against, right now in Ohio, they're proposing a bailout bill for nuclear power plants. They want to add a charge to every electric bill in the state of Ohio and just give that money to Davis Bessie and, and Perry, give it to First Energy that owns them just to keep them running because they're uneconomical. They're not only horrible environmental uh, disasters, they, they also don't pay for themselves. They're losing money on these new plants because wind and solar are now not just cleaner, they're also cheaper. So I testified against the, the nuclear bailout because it was a nuclear bailout. But a lot of other groups were represented there. A lot of other organizations got up um, and it was kind of interesting because it was all the environmental organizations where the person was wearing a big, expensive suit. Uh, those got up and they were saying, you know, we don't have any problem with the nuclear, but, you know, don't change, don't take away other things that are bad in this bill, like the efficiency standards and, and don't, you know. So to me, those organizations have failed the test. They're not really... Um, meeting the definition of an environmentally conscious organization. So I actually am the uh, 
political director of the Ohio Green Party. And on this show, I don't speak for the Green Party. I only speak for myself. But there were some organizations that understood the fundamental principle, the ecological wisdom of not creating these wastes because we don't have a solution for these wastes. There are all kinds of things proposed. Um, there was a, a waste plant, a, a dump that was called the Waste Isolation Pro Project, WIP it was called, and they had a fire. And in that fire, they released clouds of radio radioactive um, atoms into the environment. So, and then, of course, there was Yucca Mountain. You might have heard that. They might have they said that, oh, we'll put all the waste in Yucca Mountain. Well, they hollowed out Yucca Mountain, and they did studies of Yucca Mountain, geological studies, and they found that Yucca Mountain is full of holes, it's full of cracks, it's full of groundwater flowing through it, so that if they put the nuclear waste there, it was guaranteed to leak out and poison the surrounding area in Nevada, again, for quarter of a million years, 250,000 years. So we've been generating this stuff, and I, I'm gonna, I'll, re, I'll relate another story from, from my youth. Uh, on my 18th birthday, I went to a symposium on nuclear power, and they had people there who were both in favor of it and who were against it. And at the end, it was supposed to be a debate between a pro-nuclear and an anti-nuclear person. So the and the pro-nuclear person gets up at the start of the debate. Well, actually, it was the anti-nuclear person said, well, at the very start of this debate, let's tackle the, the nuclear waste question. And the pro-nuclear person stood up, and he announced to the auditorium, he said, I want to announce here right now that we have a solution to the nuclear waste problem. And the, the anti-nuclear person was like, what? Well, well what is it? And the pro-nuclear person said, I can't tell you, but trust me, we've got one. And that was that was about that was almost forty years ago that this happened, and it's very clear now that he was just lying. And that's the amazing thing about the nuclear power industry, if you follow it the way I have. They have lied every step of the way. They've lied from the inception of their industry. It was promised to us that nuclear power would be safe, it would be cheap, and it would be clean. And it turns out that nuclear power is the most dangerous form of power on the planet. It's the most dangerous kind of power that humans have ever created. And if you doubt that, uh, I would suggest you take a, a trip to Chernobyl, where they've got the huge exclusion zone where no humans can live, and no one can live there for thousands of years. Or take a trip to Fukushima, where there's abandoned houses, abandoned cities, a nuclear power plant would can put enough radiation out into the environment to render an area about the size of Pennsylvania uninhabitable for the foreseeable future. Now, in Japan, they are pushing that. In Japan, they are claiming they've cleaned it up, they've created mountains of topsoil that were that they put into plastic bags. I don't know if you've seen pictures of those on the internet, but they're saying, oh, we decontaminated. But if you actually take a Geiger counter into their quote-unquote decontaminated areas, you still find pockets of extremely high radiation. And you don't need to be, you know, every square inch of the, of the land doesn't need to be highly radioactive. Just little pockets, you know, just little areas that you accidentally shuffle through unknowingly. The distribution of radioactive atoms when there's one of these meltdowns is also very random. So you get areas downwind of it that actually don't measure any increase in radiation. And then you'll get an area literally right next to it that will have 10,000 times the normal radiation. So by, they've done this phony cleanup, and they're claiming to the world that they've recovered from Fukushima in fact, they're going to have, uh, in the Olympics in 2020, they're planning to have events in the Fukushima province. But the truth is that you cannot, it is physically impossible to clean up from a nuclear power plant meltdown. And that is something that is another lie of the, the nuclear power industry. 
I was I was going back over the lies that they told. They, they first they said it was safe, and we see that it is not safe. And in fact, we see that people who work in the nuclear industry they they have um, these sacrificial lambs. They have people that come in during refueling and during maintenance that have to put on the badges and they have to get exposed to a year or two years worth of radiation in the course of like five minutes. So what they do is they run in and they, let's say they turn a, a nut with a wrench. They give it like a three turns and then they have to run back out again. And those five minutes of exposure give them as much radiation as you and I would get during the course of a couple years. And if you have to do that, that's not safe. If you can't be exposed to something, it's not safe. And these spent nuclear fuel rods are literally the most dangerous thing on the planet. They're, they're, most, they're the most dangerous things in the world. If you walk towards a spent nuclear fuel rod from a nuclear power plant, you will be dead before you reach the rod because they give off so much radiation that they will literally just tear your cells apart as you're approaching it, and you, it will kill you. And there's another extra terrible danger to these rods. Right now, all the spent nuclear fuel rods in the country are sitting in swimming pools on the site of the reactors. And the reason that's true is because the federal government has said, oh, we'll take your nuclear waste. Um, that's not your responsibility, First Energy or whatever company there is. But you can't, we won't take it until um, you have, until we found our permanent repository. Because otherwise, they're going to be shipping these things around all over the country, back and forth. Maybe we'll put it here, maybe we'll put it there. And it was recognized that the danger of that was so immense that it's better to just leave them sit until we found a permanent repository. The problem with that is that now all these nuclear plants have 30 years or 40 years in some cases of spent nuclear fuel sitting in these swimming pools. And a spent nuclear fuel rod it's not like chemical fuel. It's not like you've used it up, it's not going to work anymore. No, spent nuclear, nuclear fuel rods are actually more radioactive and they're more reactive than the fresh rods that go into the core. In fact, that's why they have to be removed, is they get too radioactive and you can't control the, the nuclear reaction the way you want to because they're getting filled with more and more radiation because as the plant operates, it shoots off neutrons, non-radioactive atoms absorb these neutrons, and they transmute and they become radioactive atoms. So you've got these horribly radioactive rods sitting in these swimming pools, 30 and 40 years worth. And if there is ever an accident, if let's say they're going to put a fresh rod in and they drop it, let's say the crane fails, let's say some, there's some operator failure, and it falls across several of these other rods that are all crowded into these pools because the pools were not designed to hold 40 years worth of waste. When you bring a spent fuel rod in contact with another spent fuel rod, they start reacting just like they're inside the reactor. And so the amount of radiation that would be released if one of these fuel rods hasn't, one of these fuel, spent fuel pools has an accident is literally 10 or 20 or 30 times as much as if an operating nuclear plant melts down. And so it's immensely dangerous. It's an incredibly dangerous industry. And if you follow the industry, you know how many close calls the industry has had. Uh, I mentioned the davis Bessie hole in the head. In that accident, we came within three-eighths of an inch of meltdown. Uh, over in Fukushima, they had damage to the crane that removed the spent fuel rods. They almost had a spent fuel rod meltdown in addition to the nuclear power plant meltdowns that they had. We've come within inches of disaster many, many times. And so nuclear power is incredibly dangerous. Uh, so they said it was safe. They said it would be too cheap to meter. Well, nuclear power is also the most expensive power. That's why we have House Bill Number 6, because... 
nuclear power plants cannot compete economically with wind or with solar or with natural gas. And so it's the most, ex it's the most dangerous, most expensive, and they finally said clean. And obviously, it, as, if you understand what we've been talking about in terms of how radiation gets into the environment, you can understand that it's literally the dirtiest form of power ever conceived of by man. And, you know, they used to talk about the, that electricity would be too cheap to meter if we had nuclear. Uh, that was a lie. They also used to talk about the, the atomic genie. You might have, some of you might have seen this cartoon. It was done by Disney. It was sponsored by the U.S. government. And they talked about the atomic genie and how in one hand he holds destruction, which is the atomic bombs, which could still destroy all of us. Yeah, that's dangerous. But on the other hand, he holds salvation, and that was nuclear power. Well, now we know that the genie was holding death in both hands and just calling one of them, uh, just lying about one of those. And so that's nuclear power, and that's um, sort of at the heart of my environmentalism. But environmentalism covers more than just nuclear power. Um, there's a whole slew of things involved with being an environmentalist. And I've had many wonderful, amazing experiences because I'm an environmentalist, an ecologist, and I've, I've done things that have been kind of incredible. Um, one of the things that I did, well, this was fairly recently, I went to a protest in New York City, a protest against climate change, that had 400,000 people at it. And I don't know if you've ever been in a crowd of 400,000 people, but it was just amazing. We were lined up. We lined up along this boulevard along Central Park. And the procession, the parade was supposed to start at like 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock came and went, and then 11.30, and then it, it got to almost 12 o'clock. And we're like, what's going on? Why aren't we moving? And it turns out the start of the protest had moved. 400,000 people is just so many people that it took an hour and a half before the line got back to us and we were able to start going. And experiences like that tell me that everybody cares about the environment. Everyone is an environmentalist. And that's very true of both Republicans and conservatives and liberals and Democrats and everybody who doesn't identify with any party, which is most Americans these days. But we're all being held down politically. We're all being held down. There's no technical reason we can't have a green future right now. There's nothing. Our technology is there. We have wind. We have solar. We haven't had a guest on last week talking about hydrogen storage. We have battery storage. We can meet all our needs with our current technology without putting any more carbon into the air, without worsening global warming. And I call it global warming because that's what it is. Right now, we have a stretch of kind of cool weather here in Ohio and the Toledo area. But planet-wise, the globe is heating up. That's, that's global warming. I don't call it climate change. It's a little too confusing, and it's like change can be good or change can be bad. We are experiencing global warming. And I personally saw some of that last summer. I, I went. This is one of those wonderful experiences I had. I went to Denali National Park up in Alaska, and it was an amazing experience. My son and I were up there camping, and um, if you ever meet me in person, ask me to show you my picture of, of Mount Denali sometime. It was, I got it at like 3 in the morning, but this was the middle of July, so the sun was up, and it was just lighting up the mountain. It was absolutely beautiful, and we saw moose, and we saw... Uh, grizzly bears and we saw regular bears and and it was just an incredible we climbed mountains together it's an incredible beautiful experience but one of the things we did see and in denali even in that remote park way up in alaska we saw the what they call the drunken trees that is the trees that are designed to grow in permafrost that's how they've evolved they're, they're part of what's called the Tiaga, the T-I-A-G-A. 
And the Tiaga forest actually right now is the most important forest on the planet in terms of capturing CO2 and putting oxygen in the air. But this permafrost, this layer of frost that's under the ground, under the first top few inches of topsoil, is melting. And what happens as the permafrost melts is these pine trees, these Tiaga trees, some of which are hundreds of years old, uh, they can't stand up straight because the ground underneath them is melting. So they sink into it and they tip over and uh, it causes what's called a drunken forest. And I could, I saw these trees myself. And I also saw big patches on the mountainsides where the permafrost had let go. And so the mountainside, mountainside had just collapsed in a landslide because the permafrost was holding the ground together. And uh, we had, a, like a week ago, we had an 85 degree day up in near the Arctic Circle over in Russia, over near the Kola Peninsula. And that is absolutely insane. The temperature should not get that high in May in the, near the Arctic Circle. And the effects of global warming are, feel, are being felt the strongest at the poles. That's where the warming is happening the fastest. That's where the changes are happening the fastest. But I've seen that that warming up in the polar areas myself, personally. Um, some other things I've seen personally that have had a big impact on me and helped me, um, basically helped make me into the quote-unquote radical environmentalist that I am today. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. You <laughs> I hope that doesn't scare you. But radical just means root. And so it means fundamental. And so I am fundamentally an environmentalist. I fundamentally want our society to operate on an environmentally sustainable level because I love our society. <laughs> I love the United States of America. I love our democracy. And I know that if we allow the environment to collapse, then our society will also collapse, just as historically so many societies have done. You know, Easter Island, the Roman Empire, a lot, you know, hundreds of societies that have come, made incredible monuments, had lots and lots of people, big, diverse cultures, and then, but they use up their resources and they collapse. And I don't want that to happen to the United States of America. As I've said before, we have the technology, we have the ability to create a sustainable future, a green future. And in fact, we must create a green future because without that, there is no future. Without that, things will collapse. So let's see some of the cool experiences I've had. Uh, yeah, I went up to Denali, saw all kinds of wildlife. I spent a week in Yellowstone uh, camping with a group of people called the Buffalo Field Campaign because the last herd of genetically pure wild buffalo or wild bison in the continental United States are holed up in Yellowstone. And there's about 2,000 of them, which sounds like a big number, but actually, genetically speaking, it's just a tiny little group because historically there were about 45 to 100 million bison in North America. They were one of the, the most common mammals on the, in, on the planet, and they covered their, their herd literally covered the center of the country. But we pretty much exterminated them except for this tiny little pocket. I think it was 25 animals that hold that hid in Yellowstone National Park. And those animals have reproduced. They've gotten bigger up to about 2,000. But that is still just a tiny fraction of the number we need to have a truly sustainable bison herd. So there's this, this group of people that live up there and they live with the bison. They Every day they go out and they hang out with them, and they watch them. And when the bison stray outside of the park, they can now be shot. They could, they could be hunted because the state of Montana has said, any bison that crosses that invisible line, we're going to shoot them. And so these, the people in the Buffalo Field Campaign often put themselves between the hunters and the bison. And they're, at the same time, they're working within the government. They're trying to get the national forests which surround the national park to be opened up for bison reproduction. 
because that would bring their numbers up to maybe 10,000, maybe 15,000. Now you've got some breathing space. Now, now you've got a large enough population that they could withstand, let's say, a really harsh winter, or they could be, um, they could have genetic diseases that won't threaten the stability, won't threaten to wipe out the entire herd. Um, you need a lot of individuals to have genetic diversity in a population, and you must have genetic diversity if a population is going to survive, or else any particular microbe, virus, or bacteria could come along and wipe out the entire herd. So I stayed with them for a week. I had amazing experiences. I snowshoed in eight-foot deep snow and in 40-degree below weather, and I saw bison up as close as I care to get to a bison because they're beautiful animals, but I'm, you know, I'm, I have no desire to take a selfie with a bison. Um, you know, I had got up to one that was, uh, oh, maybe 50 yards away. And that was, that was close enough. And they're amazing animals. And that experience was, was also incredible. And I didn't just see bison. I saw, I saw eagles. I saw swans. I saw geese. I saw heron. Um, it, it's, it's just an incredible experience that I had because I have this deep love of the environment, this deep passion for the environment. Um, speaking of 40 below, another intense experience I had because of, because I'm an environmentalist, because I, I'm trying to help preserve this planet instead of use it up and, and throw it away. Um, I was at Standing Rock. Uh, Standing Rock was a protest where there were about 10,000 people and they were trying to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline it's called DAPL. And these people put themselves in front of the mining equipment. They, they stopped the pipeline and they held it at bay for almost a year, for nine months. And they did this in the most in the harshest environment there is in North America. Uh, it gets incredibly cold there and incredibly dry, and it's very windy, and they have huge storms. But these, these protesters weathered all of that, and they helped each other, and they created this amazing community. I was only there literally for the last week of the protest. It was, it was 2016. It was during a year that I was uh, running for... Uh, U.S. Senate as a Green Party person, and so I wasn't able to go earlier, but um, there was a point at which there was a call put out for people to come help support the protesters because they were think because it looked like they were going to get ready to raid the camps. So I went there, and I spent about five days in the North Dakota wilderness, and there I saw antelope, I saw bald eagles, um, and I saw these people who had made enormous sacrifices, who had been living basically subsistence living for nine months out in the wilderness to try to stop this pipeline because they understood that this pipeline is part of what's killing this planet, that the carbon dioxide uh, and the methane that will be released from having this, this pipeline will be this is contributing to the global warming, and the global warming threatens literally all of us. The global warming doesn't just threaten poor people in low-lying areas, although they are at most risk. The global warming threatens every single one of us, no matter what our station is, no matter where we are. But it was, but just being there was this amazing experience. Um, my phone didn't work. You know, I had no, no access to the outside world. And so I had to just live out there in the wilderness with them. And, you know, they ate communally. Uh, there was singing everywhere. People were supporting each other. Unfortunately, I got there right after the main camp had been raided. And so people were in kind of shock because there was a lot of police brutality used there. And there were people going through the camp saying, oh, we've all got to leave. And the, the authorities were offering people $400 and a bus ticket to anywhere in the country if they left. And so a lot of people who had been brutalized in the destruction of the first camp, I was, I was at a, a camp called um, 
uh, sacred stone. And so that was the fallback camp. That's where I came in. And so a lot of people at the sacred stone camp didn't want to go through that again. And so um, a lot of them left. And in fact, almost everyone left. And I was kind of there, and it was a surreal landscape because people had abandoned uh, cars. They had abandoned these structures that they had built to live in. They abandoned literally every sort of camping gear you can imagine. Imagine 10 acres of camping gear and sleeping bags and books and, and pallets and shelters and tents and yurts and even igloos just abandoned. Um, and it was a heartbreaking thing to see that the destruction of this beautiful, beautiful community that had fought off the forces that are destroying our country for about nine months. And uh, I ended up getting arrested. I, I refused to leave. I was like, those these people have sacrificed so much and and the the issue is so vital and just as a sort of nod to their sacrifice, I stayed and I got arrested and spent several days in a South Dakota jail. They drove me 200 miles away because they said, oh, we don't put white people in jails that have Native Americans in them. So I ended up uh, 200 miles away and then they uh, this ended up putting me out on the street there in South Dakota after several days in jail with not without my car and with like no transportation back up to North Dakota or, or no way to get home. Luckily, a, a native couple uh, I hooked up with there uh, came and rescued me, and I'm very grateful to them. It's DJ and Wilma, um, and they they literally saved me, and, and I and managed to fight to allow me to get back onto the encampment to retrieve my car, and I made it home. But um, but the experience of being there has stuck with me. The experience of seeing um, nature in the wild, of hearing the coyotes at night, and seeing people living in conjunction with the natural world and not having to completely tamp down the natural world and cover it over with asphalt and, and lawns and not control every plant that's growing near them. Uh, that was a, a very moving experience. And when you have enough experiences like this, you, you kind of realize that the things that we're all working for, you know, in order to have a, a big house and in order to have lots of stuff and in order to have a, a nice car, that those things aren't really, a lot of times they're not as good as what you would get if we were just living a, a simpler, more natural lifestyle that had more community, that had more singing, that had more friendship and less competition and less, uh, more singing and less, less getting pumped full of music. I mean, I'm on a radio station and, you know, I, I, I love listening to radio and I love listening to music, but there's something about being in a group of 10 or 15 or 20 people singing that it's a different kind of music. It, it, it does not, it's kind of like the difference between uh, organic food and food that's covered in pesticides and herbicides. I mean, it just tastes better. So, um, so I've had experiences like this all my life, and they've really affected me, and they've hardened me as an environmental activist. But I've also had heroes. I've had, um, I've had people like uh, Carol Mongerson. Um, Carol Mongerson was a housewife in West Valley, New York. And sh there's a radioactive waste dump there at West Valley. And she noticed that people were getting sick around her. And she noticed that things weren't quite right with that uh, nuclear waste dump. And she was just an ordinary housewife, but she taught herself, she taught herself um, all about radiology. She taught herself about the effect of radioactive atoms on people's body and on the environment. So she learned all about half lives and and uh, uptake and how you know things get absorbed through the skin and breathed in through the lungs, and she formed a citizens group because what had happened is there was a it was a reprocessing place where they took in nuclear fuel rods and nuclear fuel reprocessing is a way to take a ton of nuclear radiation and nuclear 
uh, waste and turn it into 10 tons. They had this process at West Valley. They would bring in the fuel rods. They'd dissolve them in acid. Then they'd suck out the plutonium and the uranium to make new fuel rods. But what they're left with is tons of sulfuric acid filled with these other 198 radioactive atoms that they don't use. And so whenever somebody talks about reprocessing and, oh, oh, it's great, all that fuel that's sitting in those pools, that's just new fuel for future nuclear plants. No, no, that is 98, you know, percent that is radioactive atoms that are going to kill people. And, and maybe you can pull out that 2%, but in the process, you'd make a lot of waste. So she fought the federal government. She fought the state government, Carol Mongerson did, and she got the West Valley plant closed down and she got the wastes. They developed the technology to put the wastes in um, glass called vitrification. And so the wastes there now are stable. And that would not have happened had she not stepped forward. What would have happened is that the wastes, which were buried in open pits on the grounds next to a stream, that stream would have eroded all the way to the wastes and it would have contaminated Lake Erie. And so Carol Mongerson was one of my heroes. Sadly, she died of um, cancer, as a matter of fact. Uh, another one of my heroes was Petra Kelly. Petra Kelly was one of the founders of the German Green Party. And she was an amazing woman. She, she said all kinds of fantastic things. Uh, for example, she's the one who said that greens are neither left nor right, but out front. Because, you know, some people like to paint us as just socialists or communists. No, no, the, greens, the green philosophy is independent of capitalism or socialism or um, communism. The Green Party is based on 10 key principles, and those include things like ecological wisdom, grassroots democracy, social justice, and future focus. So Petra Kelly was one of my heroes. She, she started a process that today has culminated in a very powerful Green Party in Germany, and they've, that's why Germany decided to shut their nuclear plants and to shut all their coal plants. And they're going to go to a completely renewable energy, completely solar and wind-based economy because Petra Kelly, decades ago, started them on that path. Uh, another hero of mine is a fellow named Ken Sarawiwa, and he is one of many nuclear martyrs. He lived in Kenya where they had, uh, where Dutch Shell Company had oil and gas uh, platforms destroying uh, wetlands there, destroying um, the, the mouth, the delta of a, of a beautiful river. And he was killed. He campaigned against it, and so he was murdered. And the thing about Ken Sarawiwa is that he died for a cause, and he was right. And history is going to look back on him and realize that he was out there trying to save us all from the, the, this global warming which threatens us all. So I have a lot of heroes, and I have a lot of beautiful experiences, and I, I've shared just some of them with you. I only have two minutes left to talk about uh, the green future. But I would like to ask you something. I, I would like to ask you to help me create the green future. I'd like to ask you to go to Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com is a place where you can go and sign up to become a sustaining patron of For a Green Future. You can uh, just give us a few dollars a month. It'll come out of your account every month. You don't even have to think about it. But you'd go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and you search for For a Green Future. Um, you can also get in touch with me directly. My number is 419-973-5841. And you can call me or text me anytime for ideas for the show or any questions you might have about environmental issues or about the Green Party. I'd be happy to answer them. Um, we're on the web at joedemarforagreenfuture.org. That's J O E. D E M A R E for a green future dot O R G. And uh, you can check us out there and see, see what we're up to. We're on 
Facebook at 4A Green Future, and we're on Twitter at 4A Green Future. And um, we love to hear from you. We love feedback. I know I, I couldn't get any feedback this episode because this is a, a recorded episode, but I, on our regular show, I love it when someone calls in. To me, that's a, a highlight. So we've got just about a minute left, and I want to spend that minute thanking you expressing gratitude thanking you for sticking with us for this whole hour thank you for listening to the show thank you for subscribing to us on as a podcast we're also a podcast and subscribing to our youtube channel you can uh, just search for for a green future on youtube or for a green future as a podcast you can subscribe there i love being able to talk about these things these things need to be talked about and I'm gonna, I intend to talk about them as, as long as I can, as long, long as I can do this show. So once again, thank you very much.